We're here with Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger. So Pat, just to um, you know, go back to basics, can you also tell us what the difference is between a CPU and a GPU? <laughs> well, CPU is uh, this uh, general purpose compute device. You know, as you think about it, it runs everything. You know, it could run a web service. You know, it could run, you know, an application. Uh, you know, it runs Zoom, right? It runs, uh, you know, every, you know, your uh, recipe program. It runs everything and all the software. So it's called a general purpose CPU. A GPU instead is really built for a very specific class of workloads. And generally those have been called throughput workloads. So it does lots of floating point processing and matrix operations. You know, and so it's very dedicated for things like graphics, matrix, and now, right, has worked out to be uniquely good at things like AI. And uh, so it's a very specific set of apps that have become very important. And why is the GPU so good for AI? Well, AI tends to have very specific operations that it's doing and that all it's doing is compute, 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 right? Whereas a CPU is sort of saying, oh, if then and jump over here, run this application. So it's very specific, you know, and uh, largely emerged from the whole graphics space where all it's doing is vector graphics, you know, rasterization, a very narrow set of uh, compute workloads. So it's designed basically, you can sort of think about it, you know, as your general purpose sedan, that's sort of the CPU and the GPU, all it does, it gets on the F1 track and all it does is go fast on very specific workloads. Interesting. And obviously it worked really well for gaming and that's kind of was NVIDIA's specialty. Um, is yeah. that how NVIDIA just ended up running away with the game here? Was that they built this GPU for gaming and it ended up being, they kind of lucked into it being good for AI? Yeah, and it very much is that way. And Jensen and I, you know, we've known each other for 35 years. You know, th this general purpose workload, and we always are adding more capabilities to the CPU. But over here, it was always just go really fast for graphics. And then you got really lucky that the AI workload sort of looked a lot like the graphics workload. So as I joke with uh, Jensen, I say, you know, you just were really true to that mission of throughput computing and graphics. And then you got lucky on AI. And he said, no, 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 Pat, I got really lucky on AI. <laughs> and But now it's interesting because... You have NVIDIA, okay, they're the clear leader, but every single day it seems like another company is announcing their own GPU. I know that Intel's had its own Ponte Vecchio chip uh, in mm -hmm. development, but also you have accelerators, right? Which is basically yeah. ways that um, companies like Amazon and Google will modify chips in order to be able to run AI workloads. In fact, Google just trained it, apparently its entire Gemini model on its own accelerator, not needing NVIDIA at all. So, um, just take us into that race a little bit. And does it seem like, I mean, NVIDIA's lead for a long time has seemed steep, but it seems like it's less so now. Yeah, and what we expect, you know, and when we think about AI workloads, you can think about training and inferencing. And you can think about that like a weather model, how many people create the weather model, that's training, versus how many people use the weather modeling. Oh, that's lots of people, you know, local forecasters, you know, scheduling, route maps, all that kind of stuff, use weather models. For the training application, you now have what NVIDIA does, accelerators like what we're doing with Gaudi, but also then the TPU from Google, you know, the Trainium from Amazon, what Microsoft just announced with Maya, what AMD announced, because the software there right, you know, is very specific in this class. So if I can run that Python code, as it's called, you know, the key language in this case, then huh, I'm going to go compete at that. And those machines are getting big and fast. So a lot of people are pursuing that. But in the inferencing, then you sort of say, hey, how do I mainstream that application? And that's an area that actually is just another workload. And we're going to do a lot of inferencing on our standard CPUs or the Xeon mm -hmm. product line as well. You know, so we expect that there's going to be a lot of competition in the AI space. And finally, for Intel, you know, we're also going to be a foundry. We're going to be the manufacturer for many of those chips as well. So we want to be the manufacturer for NVIDIA, for AMD, for Google, for Amazon. We want to be their manufacturing partner, even if we're not using our design chips. Yeah, I'm definitely going to talk to you about the manufacturing in a bit, but let's let's just stick with the design here. So... 
I mean, it does seem like what you're saying, though, is that this landscape is going to be a lot more competitive than it has been previously. I mean, you have a company like NVIDIA that added, what, $600 billion to its market cap in one year. Like, there are going to be others that are going to be trying to get in. Does that sound right to you? Absolutely. You know, and I sort of put them into two classes, uh, Alex. There's going to be those that build their own. You know, and that's what you see Amazon, Microsoft, Google are doing. They're going to say, hey, I'm going to own this and do this myself. And then there's going to be the general providers in the marketplace. And that's going to be Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, I think will be the three big ones in that space. So there's going to be do it ourselves. We're going to own the full stack of hardware and software, you know, which is the big cloud guys. And then there are those who say, hey, I'm going to sell my chips to everybody. And I expect those to be the big three. Okay, so wait, which which part are you going to compete in then? Both or both? Yeah, you know we're gonna you know because I want to be a foundry to what Amazon does, what Microsoft does, what Google does, and I'm going to sell my chips and I'm going to sell my chips to the enterprise customers who want to do this with their data on premise, as well as to the big cloud guys as well. And today, you know, biggest customers for Nvidia today are probably Microsoft, who's putting up their big farms, but they're saying, hey, no, I'm going to build my own chip. I'm going to build Maya. So that I do just like what Google is doing with their own TPU as well. I want to own that margin and I'm going to do it on my architecture as well. So Intel, I think, uniquely has two bites of the apple here to pursue. Right. It's interesting to hear you talk about how the AI inferencing or the running of these models is going to be done on CPU chips. I mean, it's you just kind of explain the architecture and the use of a CPU. Um, and it seems like even still a GPU would be better for... AI functionality, but are you saying that actually the CPU will will be fine? It seems like it was built well, I think, different. Yeah, and what's going to happen is AI is going to get added to every application, right? So everybody's going to start saying, how do I bring AI into my apps? So imagine I'm running SAP, right? I'm going to do a lot of my normal SAP and all of that runs on my CPUs today, but then I want to add some inferencing capabilities into my SAP environment. Hmm. You know, we believe and we're adding these matrix functions onto our CPUs. So we're extending the workloads of our general purpose CPUs to do a better job at AI. And so if the workload is just running inferencing, oh, it'll probably run better on a GPU. But if it's running a lot of things, we're going to make it just run great on the CPU. And we're finding great interest from customers to do that uh, today. You know, and for my standard CPUs today in the data center, you know, we see about a third of the purchases are being based for AI workloads. So we're already seeing that characteristic emerge quite strongly today. So explain this one to me then, because Intel has its own Pontevecchio trip, which is apparently, you know, a GPU trying to do some of this other mm-hmm. stuff. Um, how? Do, but how are you... You know, how are you going to balance that with running AI on your CPU chips? Yeah, you know, so some, you know, if the workload is running on the CPU, it's just going to stay running on the CPU. Right. Right. But then we're also going to, for these environments where all that you're doing is running AI, then we're going to offer our accelerators as well. And Pontevecchio and Gaudi, we're bringing those together into a single yeah. product line, you know, going forward, because we're going to compete in that space as well. You know, we're going to be building you know, components, whether they're GPUs or CPUs, to capture as much of the market as possible. Okay, so I know about Ponte Vecchio, it's a, it's a GPU. Uh, Gaudi CPU that runs AI functions? It's a, you know, it's called an accelerator. It okay, really accelerator. is designed for these unique matrix functions right. that are seen in AI workloads. So just give us an honest assessment of where Intel stands today compared to NVIDIA. Like, are you getting close in terms of like the volume or... Where, where is the, where, how do you compare right now to them? Yeah, no, NVIDIA is the runaway market share leader today, okay. right? We give them credit for that. Um, you know, we're now seeing our growth rate and quarter to quarter, we approximately doubled the growth rate, you know, mm-hmm. but we're still small market share, you know, today, but we're rising quickly because customers are looking for alternatives, you know, today, because this is demand and they also want better price and different, you know, features. So our business here is growing very rapidly. You know, but it's from a much smaller uh, base, but we are now winning some of the performance benchmarks. Mm-hmm. So all of a sudden customers are saying, huh, you know, they're showing up winning some of the benchmarks. You know, I want an alternative. NVIDIA is short on supply and I'm getting much better TCO from Intel. You know, hey, let's go start testing this. And we're getting a lot of interest in our value proposition. 
Yeah, in some ways, this uh, supply crunch, you know, really can end up working in your favor because people do Absolutely. something. Yeah, and it's both a supply crunch for the supply chain, right? And some of our packaging and wafer capabilities, people are saying, hey, can you help us? People who might not have considered Intel as a foundry supplier are all of a sudden saying, hey, can you manufacture, right? Even people we compete with on the product side saying, hey, can I be your manufacturer? But, you know, if your chips are working today and I can build my next uh, AI farm, you know, using you, a lot of interest there as well. So unquestionably, the supply crunch is working for us. Okay, great. So we've talked now about design. I think we've done enough on that. We can talk now about manufacturing. Um, people are talking a lot about TSMC, Taiwan Semiconductor, and the fact that, A, like I think during COVID, a lot of people realized that it was a strategic liability to have core manufacturing for the U.S. be done offshore. Now, it's going to take a while for us to get to that point, but there are there's legislation, there's funding, the CHIPS Act, that's going to give companies like yours an opportunity to start to build some serious foundry capabilities in the U.S. One, one question to you to start. Intel has tried a couple times to build foundry capabilities for others, I think twice before, and it hasn't worked out. It's very different to basically manufacture your own chips than to manufacture other people's chips. It takes, you know, off the shelf technology process, all that stuff. So what gives you confidence that this time is going to be different for Intel? Well, several, several things that we're doing differently this time. And the first, you know, I'll say on the first attempts, they were hobbies, right? It was sort of like, ah, let's go try it. You know, we really weren't taking it seriously as a company this time. I have bet the future yeah. of the company Why that not? we are going to move. Pardon? Why Why not? Like, why was this a hobby? And then we can talk a little bit more about why this is so important yeah. now. And, you know, fundamentally, the Intel business was going really well before, and this mm -hmm. foundry business model was still pretty nascent. Right. So it was sort of like, ah, oh, that model's emerging, TSMC's doing pretty good, you know, let's go try it in a few places. But mm -hmm. it wasn't taken deeply intentional as a core part of the strategy. And not very profitable from what I understand is that this is kind of like the least profitable part of the whole process, the manufacturer. Well, hey, TSMC <laughs> has gotten pretty good profits now. They figured it out, yeah. Yeah, okay. they have figured out how to make good profits here. So this is now a very profitable business, um, you know, almost as profitable as the chip business itself in many respects. Mm -hmm. You know, secondly, the ecosystem has become much more mature. And Intel before was very proprietary. So if you wanted to use my foundry, you had to be proprietary on me. Well, now we have standardized our processes like the rest of the industry. So it's much easier to use us uh, as a foundry. You know, third, I'd say everybody post COVID realizes, oh my gosh, you know, we desperately need a Western foundry at scale. You know, this is super important and we're finding that uh, interest from customers because they see their supply chains as very fragile, you know, and they have become so dependent on one company, one island, one port, you know, there's a lot of industry interest as well as government interest to build us as a world-class foundry. So we're well on the way and, you know, it's become a key piece of the strategy that I've laid out. How would you assess the geopolitical risk to Taiwan? I mean, you said one country, one island, obviously it's Taiwan. We've seen already, you know, R Russia invade Ukraine. That put a lot of people's antennas up. This might happen in Taiwan. What's your perspective on how serious we should take this? Well, you know, this is one where it's going to take years to rebuild these supply chains. Right. Like you know, it took us years. three. Th it took us three decades to have our supply chains move to Asia. You know, what we've said is, hey, we've gone from eighty twenty to twenty eighty in Asia. Wow. By the end of the decade, so, you know, seven, eight years, I think we can get close to 50-50 by the end of the decade. And if wow. we accomplish that, right, over a seven or eight year period, I think the world is going to sleep much better at night, you know, because, hey, this is, you know, a blockade of the Taiwan Straits and all of a sudden the island browns out in 30 days. You know, this becomes very precarious, right, and we can fix it. And, you know, not just the economic, but the national security benefits of this are huge. Why is it going to take so long? It takes five years to build the new fab. Really? Right. Like so, you know, what I've described, you know, we're a couple of years underway on this. But, mm -hmm. you know, if, if we accomplish this by the end of the decade, as we've laid out, you know, that is spectacular. 
Uh, you know, for a layman, why does it take five so long to build one of these factories? Well, you know, these factories, you know, first, they are just amazing, right? And I, mm-hmm. you know, I just love people to come and visit the factories. These are the largest construction projects on earth today, mm-hmm. building the smallest things that have mm-hmm. ever been built on mm-hmm. earth. I mean, it really is amazing, the precision manufacturing, the chemicals and so on. You know, it takes us about five years to have a, one of these factories up uh, up and running on a leading edge process uh, technology. You know, the total project is about $30 billion, right, to build one of these uh, factory complexes. You know, so it's an enormous capital investment, right? And, uh, you know, I end up with like 7,000 tradespeople, you know, to work for almost four years to build one of these locations. It truly is, right, a uh, manufacturing marvel, building the most advanced uh, science that's ever been done on Earth. Now, Pat, I've spoken with people in the early days who were there at Texas Instruments and were part of this offshoring mm-hmm. of chips to Taiwan. And basically, what they said was, um, it was so it was the least the least profitable part of the whole process, and they just didn't care. They didn't think about it strategically. Um, I'm curious if you think that it was a mistake to let so much manufacturing. Uh, leave the U.S. and then also like, it, you know, it, it seems like a good hedge to have a plant here. But just in terms of um, a profitable business line and a good business, like it's going to be very expensive to run in the U.S. Don't you think? Curious to have you well, watch for those. Yeah, two things. One is yes, it was a mistake, and I think the world realized how big a mistake it was in the middle of COVID. You know, that we allowed our supply chains to become so fragile. And as I say, what aspect of your life isn't more digital? Everything's more digital going forward, right? And everything digital needs semiconductors. You know, where oil reserves are has defined geopolitics for 50 years. Where technology and fabs are for the future is more important. You know, so with that in mind, yes, it was a mistake. And now, you know, with the CHIPS Act, you know, we've taken the most significant industrial policy legislation since World War II to correct that error. Now, part of the CHIPS Act was to level the playing field, right? Right. It was to close that economic uh, gap that we see with Asia today. So it's designed to right, bring those back on parity so that the investments that we're making you know, are competitive with those of Asia in the world. And I believe as the decade goes forward, we rebuild the ecosystems, we can systemically and structurally be closing those gaps in addition to the aid that's been needed to immediately fix some of that huge economic gaps that we have today. Okay, so there's, there's some subsidy there that sort of makes the economics work. And- yes. And so um, we are a big technology podcast, so I have to ask you about Apple, right? They've started designing their own chips, and they're doing a pretty good job of it. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm curious from, from your perspective as a chip manufacturer, what do you think about the position that Apple's in today? And I mean, clearly the performance is quite good on the chips they've designed. Is that something that you, I mean, obviously not every company is going to do it, but uh, what do, how would you assess their effort? Well, you know, they used to use Intel chips, and when Intel stumbled, Apple stepped in and did their own chips. So ultimately, my objective is build better chips that they want to use our chips versus doing it themselves. Right. But it also shows that this idea of the foundry ecosystem has become very mature. You know, that a company like them could step in and build very good chips. And remember, they build chips for their applications. So they highly mm-hmm. optimize them just for the Mac and for the iPhone as well. They don't do everything like, you know, the Intel chips do across many different markets. They optimize them solely for their applications and products, and they've done a super good job. And I'd say over time, hey, I'd hope to give them a better product that they could use my chips again, but I still want to be a manufacturer for them, even if they choose to keep designing their own chips uh, going forward. I want to become a foundry for them, just like they use TSMC today. And now, have you talked to them about that, or are we still seven years away from that being a reality? Of course, I've talked to them. I've talked to everybody in the yeah. industry, you know, Qualcomm, uh, NVIDIA, AMD, Google, uh, Apple, Broadcom, etc. I want them all running on our factories because that is better for them to have our technology, better for them to have more resilient supply chains. And I'm going to make it a good business proposition for them as well. Okay. Uh, you have a big AI event uh, coming up this week. Can you tell us a little bit about what people can expect there? Yeah, and you know, we, we call it AI everywhere, 
right? And in this sense, you know, AI isn't just going to be for these big high-end cloud and training environments, but how do we make it available across every PC, across every edge device, as well as our chips for the data center? And we'll be introducing, you know, two new chips. One is our main CPU, right, uh, Xeon Gen 5, that we have further enhancements for the AI workload. And we'll be introducing Core Ultra, you know, which is uh, for the client to put AI capabilities directly into your PC. Mm -hmm. Okay, sounds good. Anything uh, you think I missed or anything else we should know? Yeah, and I just say for this AI everywhere thing, you know, Intel showing up here saying, wow, we're the volume provider, you know, and much like the Centrino event was, you know, 20 plus years ago, that made Wi-Fi and access points and every coffee shop had to have, you know, Wi-Fi service. You know, it just changed the, not just the PC, but the entire way that people used computing. We see this AI PC having that same kind of shift where all of a sudden, maybe I don't type to my computer anymore. I just talk to it in the future. It knows when I'm there, it translate languages. You know, it has new insights and capabilities. It becomes my personal bot. You know, we just see it ushering in a new generation. And Andy Grove, one of the founders of Intel, described the PC as the ultimate Darwinian device. And we think we're about to go through a you know major evolutionary step in the life of the PC. And that begins today. Well, one quick follow-up. What is an AI computer? You mentioned an AI computer. Yeah. You know, think about your PC today that now has built-in AI capabilities where all of a sudden, instead of having to go to the cloud to get a model, all of a sudden my PC is able to record, translate, summarize, you know, be vision tracking in flight, you know, where you could be speaking in uh, right, uh, Korean and I could be hearing you in English and vice versa in real time. I'd look away from the screen, right? And it would summarize the conversation when I'm outside of the meeting, you know, before the call, you know, before my next call with you, it would say, hey, you know, on uh, this date in December, you spoke to Alex and remember this is his birthday coming up and don't forget to remind him to uh, bring flowers home. There's, you know, all of those kind of things would be part of that AI PC experience, as well as we see it shifting and changing the form factors as well. Cool stuff, Pat. Thank you so much for joining. Hope to keep up this conversation as we go forward. Look forward to it as well. Thank you so much. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time on Big Technology Podcast.